since I just heard a report from somebody near Dallas in Texas and also desire to share what took place. I'm sending this to you. My younger brother, my dad and I were visiting my grandfather. He lived on a farm near just outside of Dallas. It was during August, at some point around 1985. I just know the month for sure as we were on summer break. It was around 10 p.m. at night. It was damp from all the excruciating humidity that I wasn't used to. It was hot as hell. We had all the windows open at the time. My brother and I were getting settled down into bed. We had the window open all night long to let somewhat of a stagnant breeze come through. My grandfather and my dad were outside talking on the porch, probably smoking a cigar. It was late, like I said. The night was quiet, and I remember at one point, we eventually fell asleep. In the mountains out behind his house, we heard it. All of a sudden, there was just this loud screaming coming from outside. It sounded like a wild beast or something. It sounded right out of a video game. My brother and I lie there awake. We asked each other if the other person heard it, and we had. We both had. We were scared. It sounded close by, and we had actually never heard an animal like that prior to. We were silent, waiting for it to sound off again. It never sounded a second time. We fell asleep at some point from just being so tired, but we were wired. The next day, we didn't hear our grandfather or father mention anything about the earth-shattering roar that had occurred last night. They had to have heard it. It was so loud. We were on edge still. After getting up and having breakfast, my brother and I went out to explore a little. It was a beautiful day, so we thought why not. We came to a big pile of brush and bush, which we couldn't see from the direction that we came from. We had thought we saw someone else off in the distance. Then, we realized that it wasn't a person at all that we were looking at. It was walking about 100 to 200 yards away from us, and we finally got a good look at it. We could see it was not a person, bear, or a Bigfoot. This thing had the head of a dog and had a big gorilla body covered in black hair. It was about 8 to 10 feet tall, fur from its head to its toes, and was overly thick and muscular. We watched in astonishment as it walked throughout the open tree line until it was out of sight. We told our grandfather and dad about it and got an interest out of them. We traveled back to the spot we just had the encounter, all four of us in total. We even went to the same path over in the trees. We wanted to copy the same path it was traveling and kept hearing something in the distance. We were all really curious now. We could all hear it. It sounded just up ahead of us, so we decided to try and track it in two separate groups. We kept traversing up on the path. We couldn't believe what it was we were seeing. A trail of the largest canine prints any of us had ever seen in our lives. They were like dog prints, but huge. We also kept hearing something ahead of us the entire time. We kept venturing back a little ways more to the thicker portion of the woods. This thicker portion of the woods rests upon the downslope of a hill. You have to come out of a cleared timber area and then enter into the thicker portion. This is about 30 minutes from where we were just from. We had been following the large canine tracks through here. We come out of the trees and we all see the same large dog-headed, gorilla-bodied animal turning into the thicket about 50 yards away, much closer than last time. We all got a pretty good look at it too. My brother and I weren't scared of it, except just really interested that such a thing like that could even exist without us ever knowing about it. My grandfather mentioned he had never seen such an animal before in his life. I'll start off by saying that I live in northern Arizona, just a tad outside the small town of Holbrook, very close to the little Colorado River. I don't know exactly how familiar you are with Holbrook or any of the surrounding areas, but it's a vast wasteland of nothingness, which 
if you seek solace in the desolate, it's a wonderful thing. Something weird has been going on through this past year, though. Before I jump right into that, let me give you some of the details. It's almost impossible to live down here and not be somewhat immersed in Navajo culture and tradition. I'm well aware of skinwalkers and that they are very much a thing here. Personally, I haven't really had any encounters with them myself, but know many individuals who have. I am also close friends with these individuals, so I know the signs to look out for. But something I don't quite understand is some of the things that are taking place. I'm sure many of you know that Arizona and much of the southwestern U.S. have a very healthy population of coyotes. It's often that you will hear them howling in the distance and outside. This is not an uncommon thing. In the past year, though, I've been hearing them less and less, and these weird yipping and crying noises, these pained cries, fearful cries, nothing that I'm used to hearing from these animals. It's strange. I have no plausible explanation. It was only a few weeks after I started hearing these things that I actually saw my first dead coyote not far from where I live. Its spine was completely snapped in half with its two front legs, ripped entirely off its body. It couldn't have been too old, maybe a couple few days at most. The sun and dry heat had mummified it, but I was surprised to see that it didn't even have a smell. Much of its gut and back legs had huge bite marks taken out of it. Looked like a fucking shark took chunks out of this thing. The meat wasn't ripped off the bone, as you would see with traditional kills from predators. Whatever killed and ate this coyote took literal chunks of flesh and meat off the carcass. A shark came to my mind as the only living thing that I think can take chunks of meat off an animal like that. Whatever it had to have been was very large, far larger than a coyote. We don't have bears down here to my knowledge. Bears also don't eat coyotes. Not like this one, how it was killed and eaten. It was extremely strange. I'm not sure how coyote's front legs get ripped off and its spine snapped. This was over a half a mile away from any roads, so I'm not sure how its death truly occurred. In the next month, I continued to hear the crying, whining and yipping. The howls that I was so used to hearing were becoming less and less. I started having friends mentioning to me that they thought it was strange, the large uptick of dead coyotes around the area. I expressed what I found to a close friend when he and another family member also expressed to me similar findings. I know some talk about it being a skinwalker, but I don't think a skinwalker does this, or do they? I'm in my 30s now, but the story I have for you takes place back when I had just turned 18. For my birthday, my dad had gifted me with a red 2001 Dodge Ram. Things drove slicker than butter. It was beautiful. I was also a senior in high school at the time, so this was going to be my truck to and from school, so I didn't have to ride the bus anymore. Yeehaw! I thought I was such a badass at the time. Now, during this, we lived out in a more rural area in southern Indiana. That's where my sister and I, who was also 16 at the time, similar to my age, went to high school at. I remember when my dad gave me the keys and how excited I was to be driving that thing. My sister was so excited for me, she demanded I took her for a drive in it while she got to sit in the bed of the truck while I drove it. We hopped in and I took off. I just drove around for about 15 minutes around the area. Lots of lone roads, not a lot of houses. This was in August too, so it was very hot outside. I was loving the AC of the truck. Kept me nice and cool. My sister is sitting right next to the back window in the bed of the truck. At one point or another, she starts pounding on the window, and I reach with my one hand to open it. She starts screaming at me to haul ass that there's a big, hairy werewolf running after us. I started to laugh at her, but my eyes naturally kind of just glided over to the rearview mirror, where to my horror, I discovered she wasn't lying. Coming up behind us on the road was this werewolf-looking creature. 
It was running on two legs like a man, but slanted forward, more like an athletic runner, actually. It was covered in long, shaggy dark hair and had a long snout and big ears. This thing was fast. Feels like it caught up to us pretty quickly in the time I looked up and saw it. I gunned the truck up to 70 miles an hour, and eventually it couldn't keep pace with us. I didn't see what happened, but my sister says that after a couple of minutes, it darted off into the forest on the left side of the road, but it kept right up with my truck. It was so close to the bed of the truck, it could have just jumped up and gotten my sister, whatever the hell it was. We fly back to mom and dad's, and my sister is in the bed of the truck, hyperventilating. She was so scared. She was hardly able to talk or even breathe, and I tried my best to calm her down. My dad at the time just happened to come outside, noticed we were back from our little joyride, and walked over to ask us how the drive went. He clearly saw my sister in a full-blown panic, and that she couldn't catch her breath, and got concerned, asking what was the matter. I told him we saw a big black bear, and that it scared her. We're both trying to calm her down. She does eventually calm down, but doesn't tell my dad what we saw. We both knew he wouldn't believe us, especially telling him something that looked like a werewolf off the howling, chased after our vehicle for a couple of miles. Yeah, right. We'd have a better chance at getting him to believe that we had told him we were already Nazi scientists in disguise. Later that night, when it was just her and I, I asked her to recount exactly what she had seen running after my truck. I didn't want to convince myself that I made it up. I wanted to know for a fact that I wasn't crazy, and something really did chase after us. Her recount is exactly the same as what I recounted. We didn't just dream it up. We weren't drunk. We weren't high. We weren't intoxicated in any way. I don't know what it is that chased us. As far as I knew, it was just some large wolf animal. I never actually thought of werewolves and that thing being in the same category. It did resemble a werewolf like you would see in the movies and pop culture, but I can't get behind the traditional idea of it being a werewolf. Someone who shapeshifts into that and then chased us. I think it was just some unknown large animal that was maybe chasing us out of its area or territory. I don't know. I don't have answers. We had lived there for years in that area, been all around and never ran into any problems or ever heard from any relatives, mom or dad, or any friends of any sort of animal or creature that fit that description. Before I go though, I did want to point something out to you real quick. I mentioned the movie The Howling, which I have seen the whole series before. I have actually seen many werewolf and scary movies, but that's besides the point. Whatever animal chased my truck for a few miles did look similar to the werewolves from the movie The Howling, but still looked a little different. Nothing I've ever seen from a movie looks exactly like what me and my sister saw that afternoon. It was big. It was bigger than the werewolves in The Howling movie. It had that same kind of wild shaggy hair though. Very similar face. My sister got a much better look though than I did. I had to keep my eyes on the road and from crashing the car. She said she can't watch the Howling movies anymore because of that one day. It spooked her so bad. I think she thought it was a real life werewolf, but I can't remember. My grandparents used to own a big ranch down in southwestern Missouri. My grandfather was a renowned cattle rancher in the area years back. But my grandparents sold their ranch and gave it up after several tragedies had befallen the family and they just weren't able to do it anymore. These are all things that my grandmother, who is still alive, told me about. My grandfather passed away from a heart attack back in 2001. Bless his soul. My grandmother and grandfather got married back in the 1940s and started their own cattle ranch in that part of the state of Missouri. That's also not long before my father was born. My grandfather grew up with his daddy ranching in Texas, so it was a tradition he wanted to keep. It's all he knew. That was the life they lived. Well, years after they had my father, their cattle started getting picked off left and right. 
My grandparents feared for the worst and suspected it was a pack of wolves killing their cows. They were right, to an extent. They had friends who also maintained a couple of ranches here and there, and knew that wolves would be a general problem. This is around the time where they were heavily poached and killed, driving them out of the state. This was still in the 1940s, so right before the mass poaching of wolves happened. The wolves that were killing my grandparents' cows, however, were much different, my grandmother explained to me. They were easily triple in size, jet black, and were about eight to nine of them, with one big alpha male. My grandmother vividly remembers these animals tearing through the cattle like they were made of paper. Grandpa shot at them multiple times, but they were such large, vicious predators, it didn't do anything. Eventually, my grandfather started choosing which cows to sacrifice in hopes that these wolves would leave the rest of his cattle alone. He would pick a cow and pull it out to the edge of the ranch and stake it down there. They only ever experienced this activity near the corner of their property. These wolves wouldn't come close, but they were so large, even from afar you could see them clearly. My grandparents didn't know what they were, other than just really large wolves, or a subspecies of them or something. Shortly after these things started showing up and eating the cattle, other things started happening. This was ongoing while my grandfather continuously sacrificed his other cattle to try and keep these things at bay. They had another son shortly after my father, but died of unknown circumstances at six weeks old. A couple of weeks afterward, my grandfather came down with a near-death illness that put him out for weeks. Several of his cows would randomly drop dead, with no known causes of death, nor showing any symptoms of reasons to why they died. They would wake up in the middle of the night, feeling like they were about to die. This horrible feeling of danger and a fight-or-flight sense. They would feel these heavy waves of static electricity in the early morning hours. Not all the time, not every night, but often. Weird things like this continued to happen for months. One of their hired ranchers died of a heart attack during this time too. Another mystery because he was young, about 24, 25. A couple of their dogs went missing, never showed up again. All nine of their cats, which were used for mice catching and just around, disappeared, vanished, no trace of them ever again. We never saw them. My grandmother, whose memory is still very good, says it was from around May or spring to October. Just as soon as all this started happening and the wolves showed up, it all ended. She says it just stopped one day. The weirdness, the static in the air, constantly feeling like somebody was looking over your shoulder. It's as if this darkness was just lifted from their ranch. She said in those few months they lost 100 to 200 cattle easily, probably more. It devastated them. They sold their ranch and the house with it that winter and moved away. My grandmother recalls that time as some of the worst times of their lives and believes it was a curse of some sort. My grandmother is very superstitious and believes that somebody in town that knew them was jealous of their success, thus cursing them and their ranch. I don't know if my grandparents had any bad blood with anybody in town. My grandmother never mentioned anything of the likes, but you never know. I certainly don't know what to make of it myself. It's an interesting story. My grandmother, though, isn't the type to make up fiction and isn't too keen on nonsense. She comes from a very strict generation. She still has old pictures of the ranch they had at the time, and some of their horses and other livestock. This was long before my time. My father was too young to remember the ranch because, when they moved, he was probably still under seven years old. Anyway, I just wanted to share this with you because it's just so interesting. It sounds like dogman activity to me. I didn't tell my grandmother that she would have no idea what it is. I don't even think I've ever mentioned Bigfoot around her, so I don't know how she feels about that. The descriptions and events she gave me lines up with some sort of dogman UFO-like activity. Freaky, to say the least.
This is my dad's story when he was a teenager and went hunting with his dad out in one of their many hunting spots that they would go to. They had a handful of spots and would often rotate between them. They would always come back with kills and we were never without plenty of meat. It was my dad and my grandfather and they brought their two coon hunting dogs with them. Two coon hounds whom were called Shyla and Dalgo. My father never really told me exactly where the spot is at. I know it's somewhere north of Elkton, around north of Route 68. I think it might even be off the 164, but I'm not 100% sure on the location though. They had so many spots in southern Kentucky. I just know they went deep into the bush, I was told. My dad was born in 1950, and during this time, it would have been in the mid-60s when this event happened. They didn't have an abundance of scary movies out yet. Very few. He had nothing to compare what he saw, other than a large wolf-like predator that walked on two legs. There was nothing else to compare it to, other than this giant wolf monster. But I'll get to that. They came to an area my father describes as open, but dense with brush and were looking to set up camp for the night. I don't know if they were doing multiple days of coon hunting or they were just using that as an excuse to camp and get out for a couple of nights and hike around. Either way, they were scouting for an area to set up camp when both of their coon dogs go crazy. They run off in one direction, down this long hill to the bottom. They're howling and barking and going crazy at the same thing. My dad and grandfather are trying to call them back, realize that these dogs aren't coming back and are going after something. It's like they were possessed, how they were acting. My dad and grandfather are running after them down this long hill. Can't see much in front of you because the forest was so thick. Starts hearing the dogs whimper and cry and then silence. My father and his dad stood there listening intently at what was happening. They both began moving harder through the brush to get to Shyla and Dalgo, who are no longer making any noise at this point at all. Before they were going crazy and sounded like they were maybe 50 yards out. After a few more minutes of running, they came out of the thicker brush to a small slope where they met face to face with a creature from their nightmares. Standing there in this small area between two trees was this wolf creature standing about nine feet tall on two legs. Clasped in its jaws was the body of Shyla, nearly hanging in two from being torn open, it looked like. Dalgo was being held in its left hand, his body also lifeless. My dad and his dad just stood there looking at this thing in front of them, and this thing looked at them. It didn't move for a bit and just stared them down with the now dead dogs, one in its jaws and the other it was holding intently. It squatted down briefly and then jumped up into the trees and disappeared out of sight, with both dogs with it. Startled at what kind of animal they had just encountered, my dad and his dad ran for their lives. They weren't sure what to even do. It scared my dad to death. They got back to their truck after a while of running and got out of there. My dad told me he and his dad were so scared they didn't even fully process that their dogs had just been killed, taken by this creature. He starts asking his dad what they did see. Unsure of what it could be, but I don't think his father even had an answer for him. What do you even say after something like that happens? I'm an avid explorer of the wilderness. I always have been. I've seen strange things out there. One of the strangest things I've seen is when I was out in North Florida kayaking through the Everglades in thick swamp. I saw what I believed to be some sort of dog humanoid. As I'm rowing my kayak, I see this dog head watching me from the groves closely. I was semi floating closer to it, but also coming around a bend in the swamp. Its head followed my movement, never breaking eye contact with me, and never moved a muscle other than its head to intently watch me. I matched its intensity with me maintaining eye contact with it. I wasn't scared. I wasn't going to back down. 
I was curious and in a mild state of shock at what I was seeing. It looked to be like a canine humanoid, about average human height, six feet I'd say, covered in brown matted fur, had a shallow snout and a canine-like face. The body was more humanoid. It had a larger chest, lots of rippling muscles. It used its arms like a person, the way it was holding down the brush in front of it to see me. I couldn't clearly see its hands. Its eyes were either black or dark in color. I knew it was looking right at me the whole time. It had a startled expression on its face, like it wasn't expecting a person to be showing up and coming through the area. I'll admit, I have no idea if others come into this area, as I was just randomly exploring uncharted areas. I think it took this creature off course when it saw me. It probably has never seen other humans. My father, back when he was just a boy, went fishing with a close friend of his down at the Chambers Creek in Texas. I think it's near the town of Avalon, but I can't be sure. I would Google it. I really don't have any idea of where Chamber Creek lies in Texas, but other than just knowing of the name of the location. Anyway, he said he had spent the afternoon there fishing with his close friend. They both claimed they saw this 10-foot-tall, bodybuilding-looking creature, covered in black hair from head to foot, had the body of Conan the Barbarian with the head of a wolf. This thing was in the creek, just came out of the water and walked into the woods nonchalantly after giving both my dad and his friend a quick glance, just as if to quickly notice that they were there, but to not do anything about it. This animal, creature, or being, whatever you wanted to call it, was hulking. You could see muscle definition underneath the fur. The thing was soaking wet, having just come out of the creek, but the fur was incredibly thick. It looked like the same fur a bear had, a very thick hide. It had a long snout with teeth protruding from the tops and bottoms of its jaws. It reminded him of a dinosaur, he told me. This happened at around three or four in the afternoon, so they saw just about every detail of this thing. He said that as it got out of the water and glanced back at the boys, it seemed kind of taken aback at the fact they were there, like it wasn't expecting them to be there, and it quickly left the area. He didn't mention anything about there being a smell or anything about sensing this thing was there. Said the water was calm one moment, and then this thing comes out of it. It was hard on both of them. Scared my dad and his friend to death, but they both swear by the story is true. My dad's friend, who is still very close with to this day, told me some of the details as well. They both described the creature the same way, saw the same thing. They don't know where it came from. They had been fishing in this spot for hours when it happened, and out of nowhere, this thing comes billowing out of the creek, onto the bank of the creek, and into the woods. They didn't stick around after that. They got out of there, fast. Winter in 2010. My brother and I go scouting in the mountains in Colorado. My brother was doing some videography work for a client he was working closely with scouting out areas to shoot in the woods. I can't remember if it was a possible music video or what kind of shoot it was. He knew I loved venturing out and we always worked close together, especially when it came to his job. His job for this little venture was to scout out some good shooting locations. We went pretty off-road. I'm not native to Colorado or the area we were at, so I can't recall any specific roads. I do remember though we had come across several logging roads that were close to main roads and then followed several game trails beyond that. My brother didn't want to venture too far in because it had to be close enough for lugging equipment back and forth. We were looking for a clearing that was off of a game trail or just tucked away enough from the mass amount of people that would want to come through. We ended up following this small game trail off of a very old logging road, not even half a mile, I want to say. It was a smaller meadow. It was beautiful, even with all the snow and in the middle of winter. 
My brother loved the location. Took several pictures when his camera died and ceased to turn back on. He always brought extra batteries with him. He was always very prepared. We sat there while he tried his different battery combinations, growing more and more frustrated with each time. His camera wouldn't turn on. He was convinced it had just given out on him, taken a shit. Angry and in a foul mood, we were leaving the area when I spotted massive canine prints in the snow. They were perpendicular to the small game trail. I don't know how we didn't see them before. They looked pretty fresh. They were large enough for my brother and I to both be astonished at the size alone. We didn't know wolves got that big out here. Kind of freaked us out, so we got out of there pretty quickly. This was just about three or four weeks ago. I work for a larger bread company. I won't say the name, but I bet you've eaten their bread at some point. I make drive one of the bigger trucks that delivers the bread, so I get sent all over the state. I was heading to my destination, which was about three hours away from where I work. I'm driving on this two-lane highway, not much other traffic around. It was starting to become dusk outside. There was light out, but not quite enough to turn your lights on. I have pretty good vision, so I don't personally feel the need to have lights on as soon as it gets a little dusky. I'm driving down this long stretch of road. It's pretty straightforward. It goes down this long sloping hill and flattens out. If you looked out straight, you could probably see about three miles of the road before it curves off far in the distance. On both sides of the road, there are maybe 20 feet of just dirt and grass, followed by thick forest on both sides. There are no neighborhoods, no houses, no turnoffs, nothing. There's no reason anybody should be out here, costume or no costume. As the road is flattening out at the bottom of this long slope, I see movement off to my right. I'm in the zone, listening to music and watching the road, but not intensely. You know how when you drive, you're paying attention, but you kind of just get lost in thought. It's an autopilot thing. You know? I was doing that, and this large shape, what I thought was a person, very quickly steps into view and on the road, stops and turns its head to face me. I don't notice it enough in time, and I go to slam on my brakes and collide with this thing. I'm doing 50 miles an hour, and I'm carrying a full load. It was way too fast for me to stop any collision from happening. As soon as my truck hit this thing, it disappeared. I jumped in my seat, pulling over as fast as I could while I tried to just collect myself and digest what just happened. I'm pulled over on the side of the road, jump out of my truck and begin looking around. I'm frantic, I'm panicked, I don't even know what the hell just happened and why it vanished. I don't see a damn thing. It's still light enough at this point I can see there were no signs of anything ever being on the road or around it. I checked the front of my vehicle. Nothing. I was going crazy. I saw this thing with my two eyes, felt the impact and heard the noise. Where did its body go? I didn't run it over, and it certainly didn't fly over my truck. It was just gone. Whatever it was, I only got a quick glimpse at it. It had a wolf head and face and walked on two legs just as a person did. I remember seeing big teeth and longer limbs, but that's it. It all happened so fast. It was tall. My delivery truck isn't short by any means, and this thing's face was level with mine in the truck. So, maybe 10 feet tall? I don't know. It was such a big shape when it came out of the woods and cleared the gap between the road and the trees within just a second or two. The wilderness around me wasn't extremely dense. You could see if someone was back in a little bit or hiding. I just don't understand what even happened. Was this a demon? Did I see things? Was it an optical illusion? It certainly wasn't a person in a costume, and if it was, where did it go? Why did it vanish? I'm still trying to even process what happened, but every time I talk about my story, it gets a little easier for me. I hope this makes sense to you. It's therapeutic. I don't have many other details to give you other than what I already have.
so let me know if you have any questions about what happened. My sister, who I haven't seen in years, decided to come spend some time with me at the Buffalo National River area. We decided to spend our time at the Hideout Hollow, which is a waterfall and the many waterfalls in the area. My sister and I were stoked to be hiking and spending time together again. We grew up very close. Her career takes her to other states, so I don't see her near as much as I used to. We get out all of our essentials and get everything packed. I always like to be prepared for going out. So does she. We finally get to the parking area of the trailhead and get our stuff out. We start to get out on the trail and things around us go quiet. When minutes before they were lush with sound. My sister actually stops me and mentions it. I acknowledged her and listened for just a moment. She was right. It was dead quiet around us. I'm not going to lie. It made my skin crawl at the very moment. Then, we both heard something else. In fact, I know my sister heard it in the same time I did because both of our eyes grew as big as saucers at the same time. Heavy breathing, and it was coming off in the woods, maybe 10 feet away, not far from her side of the trail. We could not see anything through the thick brush. I felt very creeped out. My sister whispers to me, I think we can outjog it. And what does she do? Instead of going back to the car for safety, she as quietly and controlled as possible jogs down the trail further. I can't yell at her because we're trying to be stealthy, so I was left with no other choice but to follow suit. My sister can be very irrational and stubborn in the moment of hard decision making. We moved down the trail quickly and swiftly. The sounds around us were still quiet, but we couldn't hear the breathing anymore. We were both on edge and we didn't see anybody else around us. That's when, coming around a corner in the trail, we hear brush rustling. We both stop in our tracks and look over at the largest dog we'd ever seen running and jumping in the trees from branches to branches. Rather large branches, mind you. Except this just wasn't your average dog. I'm very familiar with large dog breeds like Great Danes, St. Bernards, you name it, and other large breeds, but this canine, or what appeared to be canine in appearance, had to have been at least three times the size of either of those breeds. It was so enormous, my sister nor I could totally comprehend how the branches it was landing on even began to support its weight. We're talking about a very large animal. It was covered in hair, chocolate brown in color, long and stringy hair. Face looked black, and the snout looked more... I don't know how to accurately paint the picture, but it kind of reminded me of a crocodile snout. Long, unnatural looking snout, with lots of teeth coming out the tops and bottoms. It just looked wrong. It seemed to pay no mind to my sister or I, and it never once looked over at us. My sister and I are frozen stiff. Once it's out of sight, I turn to her and said, What the hell did we just see? She tells me, I have no idea. We agreed it was probably best to just leave the trail and go home. I wasn't going to want to stick around and venture further. The thing, whatever we just watched, headed in the direction where the trail goes. On the walk back, I kept thinking maybe it was heading further up the trail to ambush us. Was it the same animal that was watching us just a few minutes prior on the same side of the trail? Things remained quiet the walk back, and my sister and I didn't speak a word to each other. We got back to the car, and I have to make sure that I'm not crazy. I have to make sure that I really saw what I did. I started asking questions to make sure we saw the same thing, and neither of us forgot or saw something different. We agreed that it was on its hind legs. It was brown, it was a lot bigger than us, and it was fast. It had a dog head and a weird looking snout, and that it was built like a bodybuilder. While we're discussing this, we're just sitting in the car. The car isn't even on, but all of our stuff is loaded, so we're good to go. 
during a brief pause in conversation, our windows are completely rolled down, and we begin hearing this low, rumbling noise. It's getting louder and louder. It pops up in my head that the rumbling noise we're hearing is actually trees, brush, and branches being moved. Something very large is headed directly towards us. I turned and looked at my sister, who is as pale as a ghost and wide-eyed. In a nervous tone, I yelled at her to start the car and to go now. Without hesitation, she starts her up and rips out of there fast. I didn't turn around to see if it ever came out of the trees at us, but we both heard something very large heading directly to us. Could it have been what we just saw? We're flying down the road, and now I'm starting to convince myself this is all just crazy. We just saw a bear or something, and we're totally overreacting like crazy. This stuff doesn't happen. My sister, who's not afraid, blatantly interrupts me and asks me, Do bears run like that? Do bears look like that? I didn't have anything to say. We just headed home. The event that transpired kind of just ruined any mood we had for hiking and having a good time. During the events, I didn't notice any smells, but since we're talking, I also didn't notice if it was quiet or if any of the birds or bugs were chirping. Only after initially when my sister stopped me did I notice. I know I have no desire to return to the area. I get sick to my stomach any time I think about it. The real question should be if anybody else had any similar experiences. I've heard that area in particular is a hotbed for Bigfoot sightings and encounters by many friends and people I know. But I don't believe what we saw that day was a Bigfoot. Bigfoot is supposed to look different. This was like a big chocolate looking black dog. I don't know. I guess I'll never know. I used to be a drug dealer back in the early 2000s and would drive to my different clients that I worked with. I only traveled by night to stay safe, or so I thought that was a smart idea during that time. In this encounter, I was headed north from Gatesville, traveling north on US 281. I was on my way, heading to Stephenville. I'm on the road and my high beams come across this shine in the ditch next to the road. I realized it was the reflection of fur shining with my high beams. And then as I get closer, I see it's this eight foot tall hairy person standing in the ditch facing away from my vehicle. As I got closer, this person, or so I thought, turns its head and that's when I see that it clearly has a snout and a large amount of teeth and tall ears. The eyes were a glowing yellow green and had this creepy, eerie look to them. It had a human-like face, but also canine-like, if that makes sense. A good blend of the two. Its upper body was very large and covered in hair. It was like I was staring at the body of a giant who works out extensively. I didn't see any hands, and I didn't see much of its arms or lower half of the torso. I couldn't tell where its legs were, and I couldn't tell what its tail or lower body looked like at all, or if it even had a tail. I can tell you it was tall to be popping up that high in the ditch like that. I thought I was seeing things when I kept rubbing my eyes and blinking, driving as slow as I can to make sure that I wasn't going crazy. I was really seeing this thing. I slowly pass it, and it keeps eye contact with me the entire time. As I pass it, I quickly look back down the road in front of me, and when I go check back quickly, it's nowhere to be seen. The rest of the way, I was trying to think, what on earth had I just seen? Did I witness some sort of escaped lab experiment? Was this an actual werewolf in the flesh? I have had that image burned into my mind forever. Who knows what it was doing in that ditch that night? I drove right by it. When I was much younger, I had a very traumatizing event that happened to me and my family. We don't speak about it. I have tried to ask my parents about it, but they refuse to acknowledge that it happened. I've had to come to terms with it myself after years and years, but 
it did happen. I don't know what it was. I do know some things here and there about dogmen, Bigfoots, Jersey Devils, and the likes. It could have been a dogman, in my opinion, but I just feel like it was more evil than anything else. It looked so evil. I hear stories of dogmen doing evil things, but are not always described as evil looking. I'll let you and your readers judge for yourselves. Growing up, I've noticed that I am sort of a magnet to the paranormal. In my teens, we moved to this old farmhouse that was built in like 1901 or something. Had multiple renovations done in the time since, but was still at its core, a very, very old house. I've had numerous experiences with hearing voices in the dark, seeing shadows come in and out of my room, feeling spots of cold air moving around the house, stuff like that. My parents haven't really noticed too much. Either they're just in total denial of all things outside the realm of eyesight, or they're just not speaking about it. As far as my experience and what happened, here it goes. Family and I lived outside of Dayton, Ohio for most of my childhood. We lived in a normal suburban area, but I lived next to an empty plot of land. We had rows of houses behind us and next to us. Our house layout is like this. You walk into the living room from the street. To the left is the kitchen. To the right is the living room. If you go straight, it leads you down a long hallway with bedrooms that goes right and left. The farthest door is straight and it leads to a bathroom. There's also a room on the left and the back door is to the right. I hope it's not too confusing to understand. I was in the living room playing with my toys at the time. I was in third or fourth grade, so maybe eight or nine years old. My dad was watching TV, and my mom was in the kitchen. It was currently dark out. I can't remember if we had just finished having dinner or we were about to have dinner. Quick note to add that all of our windows had curtains. The ones in the living room were open completely. If you looked out, you'd be seeing part of our yard and the empty plot of land beyond that. The curtains by our back door were always closed. Anyway, I distinctly remember hearing these strange scraping sounds by our back door. At first, my parents just glanced over at each other, unsure of what to make of it. A few seconds go by of this noise going on, and my dad curiously gets up and goes to check by the back door. He walks all the way back there and moves to the curtain out of the way yells something like, ah, and jogs back to the living room. Well, he didn't jog, he ran. He's so pale, I remember thinking he was sick. I'd never seen my dad look like that before, not that young. My mom is starting to freak out over his reaction. He is just standing there, not even speaking. I'm starting to get scared by how my dad is acting. Just then, a loud creak came from the living room window to our right. Pressing so hard against the glass was the most vile, wretched and demonic looking wolf head I've ever seen. I've never seen something so ugly, so angry looking in all my life. It had this giant head pressed up against the glass, staring intently right at all of us. Its eyes had a horrifying orange and red glow to them and these tiny black pupils that darted back and forth between us with an ominous grin. My mom is screaming. I'm frozen in place just like my father, totally traumatized at what we were seeing. Our window, this thing peered in at us from, was maybe only four feet off the ground. This being was crouching down to look at us, had the tips of its clawed fingers pressing against the glass. In such a way, it was like it was telling us, taunting us, that the glass, this thin layer of glass, is the only thing keeping it from us, and it could break it at any time. I had never felt true fear like that. You could just feel the negative energy this thing gave off. I sensed and understood all of this in just a matter of a few seconds, when the next big thing happens. Before I get to that, I need to express that this thing had full intent to want to scare us 
and or hurt us. The way it was grinning at all of us, like it knew we were trapped prey. I also mentioned how it was pressing against the glass with not only its face, but fingers too. You could see these thick black claws at the ends of each of its massive hands. They were very human-like, made me think of the way a raccoon's hands are, actually. It's hard to write about, to be honest. I'm getting bad flashbacks thinking about it. I also should add a little more detail about its body, or at least what we could see. We could see that it was crouching, but was so large and it was dark out and couldn't make out details. I could tell this was large or larger than our carport, which is around 10 feet. It took up most of the window. It was so big. The head itself was so massive that I didn't quite understand how it could have fit on its body. It was pressing its face against the glass so hard that I'm shocked the glass itself didn't shatter. Its snout was large and it didn't look like any regular dog. It had rows and rows of razor sharp teeth. They were all so huge. Its face though, its deformed, disfigured, demonic face was so ugly. It didn't look right. It was just disgusting looking. It looked like it came from the pit of hell. I don't know if it was a demon, or a werewolf, or a dogman, or what. This was all happening in the span of around five seconds when we hear a person outside of our house begin screaming. This thing immediately looks over towards the road at someone or something, and in the blink of an eye, it's gone. It was gone so fast that we hardly even saw it leave. My mom is still screaming bloody murder, and my dad is just frozen, and I remember running to the front door and opening it. And I see this old man walking his dog, screaming, looking in the direction of our house. He was pointing and on the phone with the police, losing it. I don't really remember what happened after that, if I'm honest with you. If there was ever talk about what to do, or what the cops said. It was pretty traumatizing for me, and I think my mind just kind of blurted out quite a bit of what happened due to the trauma. It's almost like the brain has an advanced coping mechanism for that kind of stuff. We moved out of that house about four years later. Never had any sort of scary thing like that happen again. We never saw or heard anything after that that was even remotely out of place. I really don't know what puts it. What does it equate to? I have no idea why it came to our window and stared at us. It was large enough. Size clearly wasn't stopping it from busting in and killing us. But it didn't. That's one of the things that really sticks with me. It grinned and taunted us through the glass, like we were just prey that it was playing with before eating. Then the neighbor screamed because he saw it and that's why it ran. I sometimes think, had he not been out walking his dog and not seen the thing, what if it would have broken in and killed us? The feeling is horrible, but unique. I've never imagined having a feeling like you know somebody is coming to hurt you or kill you, but that was the feeling. It was different than fear. It was worse. I'm unsure of where it even came from. I can only speculate from the land next to us. However, we are a neighborhood, and the empty plot next to us has a sparse amount of trees not a lot of brush and stuff to hide in. Beyond that is a commercial zone with stores, an auto shop, a thrift store, and a gas station. I haven't really written about this encounter before, but it's always haunted me, no matter how much I try to not remember it. Halloween can even sometimes be hard for me too. I'll see people in werewolf costumes, and I know it's all good and fun, but it just brings me back to that one memory. A close family friend of mine had this encounter that I've been wanting to type up and tell you about. This was about two years back. Just recently retold me the events that happened so I wanted to write them to you while they were still fresher in my memory. I believe this was a dogman that he saw. He's driving back from his girlfriend's house late at night. He has to get up at around 5am for work the next day so he wasn't over too late. He said it was around 10.20 when he left her house at night, and he has to drive through this long rural area, well, more of a rural road to get back to where he lives. 
Not very rural, but rural enough to where the houses are spaced far enough apart. There weren't any streetlights out there, and virtually no other cars on the road that night. The area has trees, brush, and dense vegetation, but not so overly thick you can't see. There were fields throughout here as well. I know for a fact the area he told me about is a big blackberry picking area in the summertime, around August, September, when they're ripe. Lots and lots of bramble patches. The other thing is, he had driven the road multiple times already at this point. It wasn't new to him. Not only had he been driving it just from being in the area, but had been dating this girl for like a year or two and made the trip often. Never once had he experienced anything like what happened this night. So he's on this road. It's nighttime. He hears this big crashing sound of trees behind his car, looks in his rearview mirror, and his heart drops in his stomach. Running after his car at full speed was what he thought to be a dog. It came crashing out of the trees and bushes after his vehicle. It sprang out, landed in the middle of the road, and was leaping towards his vehicle. He smashes the gas pedal, going 80 miles at slowest, if not more on this road, trying to outrun whatever this is. He says when he saw it, he just saw these red glowing eyes on this massive dog-looking shape. It was on all fours. Even though it was a dog shape, it was so big that it didn't make sense. It was tall on all fours, as the top of his car. It followed his vehicle and kept up with him for a couple of miles on this road, even slowing down when he slowed down. But it kept pace and kept leaping at his car, as if it was trying to tackle his car, but purposefully not. He just said it didn't make sense. Between going Rambo on the road and keeping his eyes in the rearview mirror on this thing, he somehow made it. At one point or another, between darting his eyes between the road and this thing in the mirror, it vanished. He was so terrified that he told me he soiled himself, had to get the car detailed afterwards. That's pretty much it. Creeps me out when he tells it to me every time. Hopefully, you and your listeners enjoyed this story. Thanks. Let me just say that I trust my dogs with my life. Their instinct is far better than mine, and if they sense something, then I trust it. The thing is, my dogs only really freak out when they sense another dog around, so I tend to keep them by themselves most of the time. I had three dogs, and then my third one vanished. I have a Rottweiler mix and a lab, and then I had a smaller weenie dog. The small dog was my late wife's. She just passed away about two years ago, so it's just been me and the dogs since then. Our neighborhood is relatively small with only a handful of surrounding neighbors. It's quiet most of the time. I let my dogs out to go pee and sometimes just to hang out, get fresh air, that sort of thing. The weenie dog was already outside and had been when this happened. He spends most of his time out in the yard. That's where he likes to be. It's usually just my two dogs and me in the house. Well, this one particular night, I went to go let my dogs out and they started acting funny. They were whining. Faintly, but they were still whining. I thought, what the heck? They never whine and not go out. I tried to make them go outside. The door was open, but they just refused. I thought they were acting real funny when their hair started standing up and they went from whining to acting nervous and being hostile, both their eyes darting around outside the window and around the house. What the heck had gotten into them, I thought. They both started barking up a storm, and here I am yelling at both of them to stop their hollering before they wake up the entire town. Just then, something slammed into the side of the house so hard it knocked me over. Things off my shelves fell, furniture had fallen, I thought somebody drove into the house. My dogs are going ape shit at this point, which they never do. Like I stated earlier, they never act up unless there's another dog around. I should have thought about that. I go running outside thinking somebody crashed into the house somehow. I run outside, it's pitch black. I'm not outside for more than a second 
before I am greeted with the deepest rumble I have ever heard. After a second of processing the sound, it was a growl, a growl that came from a huge animal. That's when the smell hit me, the thick smell of wet dog and urine. It was so strong like I had just walked into a large cloud of it. I ran back inside the house and slammed the door. My mind is racing a million miles an hour, trying to think of what to do. My mind went to my weenie dog, how he was outside when all this was going on. I started to fear for him, thinking I should go play hero and run out and grab him. I knew there was something outside my small house. I don't know what though. I didn't feel adequately safe enough to brave it. After a while, my dogs did calm down, but, but the eeriness still lingered in the air. It was late at night, and I struggled to find any rest. Eventually, I fell asleep from sheer exhaustion alone. The next morning, my dogs woke me up, licking my face. I worried about the weenie dog, and I ran outside and he's nowhere to be found. I called his name over and over, and didn't hear him or see him, or any signs of him. I took the time to look around and saw no trails of blood, or tracks, or anything that showed the dog was taken. The dirt around my house is very soft and light. My dogs and I always make tracks. We spent some more time looking over by the house when we heard the sounds last night, and what do you know? We found canine tracks. These tracks were double the size of my dogs. They were massive. I knew in my head that we had some large dog here last night. That would explain the urine and wet dog smell. It also explains why my dogs were freaking out. I just think it was some huge wild dog, but I don't know. Those are very big prints for a canine. The largest I've ever seen. I figured a wolf. A huge wolf. I wasn't too concerned about that in the moment, more so finding my other dog. I spent the better part of a few hours trying to track him down and couldn't. Put signs up around the neighborhood looking for him, and nothing ever turned up. I fear that whatever dog it was that came in my backyard that night took him. Considering the obvious size difference and the fact he's so small, I don't think he stood a chance. It's hard for me because that dog meant a lot to me. Hi What Lurks Beneath. I just discovered your channel rather recently and have a story you might find of interest. This is a true story and happened back in a time where no one knew about this kind of stuff. I mean, there was Bigfoot, but I always thought that was just a hoax. This would have been in 93 or 94. I was a teenager at the time and my family was celebrating my little niece's fifth birthday. My aunt and uncle had a monstrous sized backyard that sat practically on a hillside. It was in the summertime and all the kids were outside playing. We hadn't cut the cake yet, or done presents. So I'm sitting there, bored as ever, and I feel the need to relieve myself. Thinking that it's just faster to trot over to the trees and let nature happen than go back into the house. I do just that. No one is really paying attention and I go just a few trees in to where you can't quite see me. I take a whiz and as I'm walking back out of the woods, as soon as I take a step out of the woods back to my aunt and uncle's backyard, I lock eyes with something. Whatever eyes I was looking at were across the yard and the trees over there, closer to where the kids were playing, probably no more than three to four trees back. These were large eyes and looked angry, very intense. They glowed this evil amber color. I made out that they were high up off the ground and whatever they belonged to was much larger than I. I felt like I was lost in a trance with them momentarily when I felt my stomach not up. I felt sick. I didn't know what they belonged to and I didn't even think. I felt an overwhelming sense of danger and began making a huge scene, waving my arms and hollering, screaming and yelling at the top of my lungs. Half my family didn't even bother to stop what they were doing and look at me. The others just thought I was being crazy. I got the children's attention though, and my niece just looked confused. I started pointing and yelling something is watching us through the trees over there. Some of my family turned and looked to see what I was talking about. 
Some of them must have seen it, because after I said that, some of my family began screaming, pointing, and panicking. I just see this flurry of children being scooped up and brought inside while other family members who didn't see it exchanged confused and concerned glances. I didn't bother to look up and see if it was still there myself. Instead, I briskly headed to the house as everybody else did, or at least most of my family. Inside, I was met with fearful looks and whispering. My uncle was already on the phone with the police. We're all staring outside the back window to my other family coming in and yelling at them to hurry up. There's something out there. Half of us are staring at the woods behind them, when like a choir, everybody starts shouting and shrieking in unison. We all saw it with our own eyes. A living werewolf stepped out into the open, looked up in our general direction, dropped down to all fours, and ran off in the opposite direction. I use the term werewolf because that's exactly what it looked to be. The sheer size alone was terrifying, enough to make a grown man's knees tremble. It reminded me of an upright walking bison until I saw its very wolf-like features. That should give you a good reference for its size. Then, the fact that it was faster than lightning, striking, was traumatic in its own right. It was blacker than midnight, and it is forever burned into my memory banks. Something weird that I remember is when it dropped down to all fours, it seemed as if it wasn't able to do that. Its massive arms were much larger than its back legs, and its back legs didn't look right. After it bolted off, everybody is howling and yelling. The kids were crying, convinced that whatever we saw was going to come and get us. I was in such a state of shock I couldn't believe what we had all just seen. My aunt spent a while trying to calm the children down, telling them it wasn't going to get them. I'll never forget my niece crying and telling me she never wants to go back outside again. This was the worst birthday she'd ever had. It was heartbreaking. My uncle was still on the phone with the police and he's going insane now screaming and breaking down, saying there's a monster behind his house. We were all frightened. We had no idea what any of us had just seen. We were all so afraid. Much of that evening it's a blur because I feel my brain tried to block it out. In the same way, the brain acts as a defense mechanism for trauma. I didn't even think my niece remembered it. Lucky her. I tried not to reflect back on these memories too much, it bothers me to even think about that thing watching my niece and her friends play. God knows what it was planning to do to her. My granddad has some wild stories to tell. I thought I would share some of them with you. For starters, my granddad lives in Kansas, always has. I think he farms quite a bit out there, but I'm not too sure. We speak sometimes on the phone, so I try and pull as much information out of him as I can. My grandfather is a pretty laid-back guy. It really does take a lot to set him off. Touch one of his tractors, though, and oh man, it's a big deal. His tractors are his pride and joy. I think he has such fond memories of himself riding with his dad and granddad when he was a little boy. Either way, he spends a lot of time on them and he loves doing what he does. My granddad owns several acres of land he uses and tills and plants a variety of plants and such. I don't know exactly how many acres, but I know he uses many of them for growing things. This is important because it has to do with the story that he told me. Near one of the fields he was out tilling with his tractor, he noticed some sort of strange whistling coming from the tree line near him. He stops his tractor and turns it off to get a better idea of what was making that noise. Out of the woods suddenly jumps this massive Anubis looking dog creature. That's how my granddad describes it, Anubis looking. He said it pounced on the tractor. It came out of the trees like a lioness jumping in the air on a gazelle. He said he was so frightened he nearly fell off his tractor and made a beeline for his house. This creature jumped onto his tractor and started tearing the engine out through the side with its claws and jaws. Said it so big that when it landed on the tractor, 
he was nearly thrown off himself. He fleed for the house and grabbed his shotgun, preparing to kill whatever big Egyptian animal had just attacked him and his tractor. He goes back out there, and this thing is gone, but his tractor's engine was torn halfway out of the tractor and destroyed. Some massive Anubis-looking animal jumps out of the tree line and tears through metal and steel into an engine. My granddad felt like he was going to be called insane if he told anybody. Nothing has that kind of power. And how was he going to talk about this with anybody? At that moment, he had an epiphany that a mere 12 gauge isn't going to do anything to something like this. As scared as he was, he was going to defend his farm and his life. Leaving the tractor there, he didn't come back to that area of his property for days afterwards. He was going to have to get his truck back from his brother, who was currently borrowing it. The truck, I don't remember a maker model, was the only way he was going to tow that torn up tractor away from the area and finish tilling the soil. He had to continue tilling it. Days passed, he got the truck back. Keep in mind at this point, he's living in tremendous amounts of fear and anxiety. His prized tractor was torn up by some sort of mutant dog creature that could tear through metal. He was a mental mess, he told me. Anyway, when he braved up enough to go back to that area to lug the tractor over to his barn is when he saw them. He's driving his truck, stops by the tractor, and tries to make it as quick as he can. He doesn't want to hang around longer than he had to. He parks and starts to get equipment out of the bed of his truck and notices the stillness around him. This makes him even more uncomfortable. Before he could fully finish that thought though, he hears a noise behind him. Turning around in response, he is shocked at what he sees. He collapses, smacks his head on his tailgate, and falls unconscious. What he saw, not even 20 feet away from him, were two of the same creatures he just saw a week ago who pounced on his tractor. There were two of them, but they weren't the mammoth-sized version that he had seen. These were smaller, shorter than him even. My granddad is probably 5'6 on a good day, so these must have been a little smaller. He said they looked young and that they were probably the creature's kin. Even their features that resemble the creature he had seen but much more undeveloped and juvenile-like, if that makes sense. They gave him a menacing, intense stare that he believes was set out to intimidate. It scared him so bad he lost his balance, fell, and hit his head, knocking him out in the process. He woke back up and said 12 minutes had passed, judging by his watch. He immediately remembered what he had just seen in the trees. Looking around in a panic, there was no sight of the Anubis-looking beings anywhere. But his truck, his truck was gone. My granddad, who is near having a heart attack from fear, just lost his mind. He thought he was going insane. His truck that he had kept running, placed in park and opened the bed to get supplies out, was now gone. There were no traces of it. It was evident that in the partial soil, the tire marks he had made when he drove up to the tractor. If anyone had hopped in this thing and drove it off, you would see tire tracks in the soil. It was impossible not to have tracks. There were none. It was as if this truck had simply vanished into thin air. The other problem with this is my granddad lives alone, and his nearest neighbors are a mile in either direction. One is an older widow in her 90s, the other is a younger couple in their 40s who raise livestock. The spot in this acreage is where all of this took place and it's far back behind his house. From the back of his house, you can't see where he is at the time since it was over a small hill. His driveway is also very long and winding. Again, you can't see his house at the base of his driveway and you can't see where he was by his house. This means that somebody had to have gone all the way up his driveway without him knowing and by his house. Then, knew that my granddad was back in that part of the land, came all the way out there, saw the truck, saw that he was unconscious, drove it off the plot of land with no tracks, footprints, or signs of ever being present. It wasn't physically possible. Again, there would be tracks. 
you would have heard something or saw somebody. My granddad runs as fast as he can back to his house, calls the police, and only explains part of the situation. I was working, slipped, and hit my head and knocked myself out. When I awoke, my truck was gone. The police showed up and investigated a stolen vehicle. They checked in around the area, they checked in with his brother, and nothing. Nothing ever did turn up. My granddad started losing it and began feeling like he was on the verge of a psychotic meltdown. Trying to cope and think about how to move forward with his life, he began seeing these creatures come around his land and close to his house. This is when he really felt the need to try and upgrade his weaponry. My granddad had some close buddies of his that served time and somehow had access to weaponry they shouldn't have had access to. It was more of a don't ask, don't tell kind of policy, I was told. They had live grenades, 50 caliber machine guns, poison gas, mines, all sorts of things. My granddad decided against using heavy weaponry, against these things, because he feared for invoking the wrath. He began to let his farm wither away, in fear of going out and being attacked by these beings. They would randomly appear on his farm, sometimes showing up in the dead of night. They would knock on his windows and peer in. Other times, he would see them walking up to his house in broad daylight and then vanish. He ultimately didn't know what to do, but kept his trusty shotgun next to him at all times. He never ended up firing any weapon at these things for two main reasons. One, he feared it would only invoke the wrath upon him and his house. He wanted none of it. And two, he knew his shotgun would probably only tickle an animal that was that fierce and enough to take down a tractor. He knew that if he had shot at the younglings, he probably wouldn't be alive much longer. He restrained out of fear, but understood if they broke into the house, he was going to go out guns blazing. He said sometimes he'd get up early in the morning and see one of the younglings looking in his window. These things were so close to the window, they were making condensation on the glass. I asked him about the description of these beings and to describe the best he can. He told me they were very dark in color, but the younglings were lighter. He said their face looked very pointed and straight. He said it was like seeing Egyptian mythology in living flesh. They looked exactly like Anubis. Black, dark fur, very short fur. Enough that you can see defined muscles, a Doberman pincher-like head, and a face with a human torso and body. Legs like that of a dog, but walking upright. No tail. When he's telling this to me, the first thing that comes to my mind is The Mummy Returns, the movie that came out back in 2001. It has The Rock in it playing the Scorpion King and Brandon Fraser as the main character. There's a couple of scenes where it shows these Anubis-like beings I showed my granddad screenshots of those creatures from the movie, and he said the resemblance was close. However, the beings he saw looked eviler and had a wild animal look to them. Their eyes were a striking and intense amber color that seemed to give off a faint glow by themselves. Kind of like neon colors do, but in a different way. Each tooth in their mouth was yellow and looked rotted. Each tooth was razor sharp tipped. My granddad made an observation that it looked like these things had multiple rows of teeth in their mouth, almost the same way a shark does. The intensity on these things' face and the feel they gave off was everything but benign. Their intelligence was something on an entirely different level. These weren't just animals. These were advanced beings. The way they looked at me, it's like they were reading my thoughts. It's like I knew that they knew that I was afraid. Speaking of fear, you knew when they were around or outside the house because you would feel it. The air would get thicker, harder to breathe. There would be times the air would be full and thick of static electricity. Multiple times did these things press their face against the windows, tapping on the glass, almost as if to taunt him. They would bare their teeth and grin at him or just watch him intently. It's like these beings were there to incite fear and to try and intimidate and scare him away. That's why he kept mentioning the intelligence of these things was astounding. 
to give some more details to exactly what he talks about when he says that he saw them. He is referring to the two small Anubis-looking beings. He told me after the story he never ended up seeing the large one again. He wondered if that was the alpha male, or the pack leader, or the father or mother. He thinks it might have been protecting its younglings, whatever on God's green earth it was. It's the only thing that really makes sense to him. They must have been passing through in that area, and it's possible he just got a little too close and Mama or Papa attacked. He attempted different means of trying to protect himself. He got his brother to come out and told him he was having bear problems. His brother laid out several active bear traps all around the property, dug different hole traps, covered the bear traps, and set up about 10 to 12 game cams around his property. My granddad never left the house during this next week, out of fear of these things showing up. Brother came back to check on the traps and the game cams, and noticed that all the traps were gone. No idea where they had gone or who took them. All eight of the bear traps that he placed around the area were gone. Every game cam was gone too. No traces of them anywhere. Now his brother is freaking out, and at this point hadn't yet seen these Anubis beings quite yet. As his brother is off collecting, or trying to collect any trap or game cam he set out earlier, is when he felt like he was being stalked. He said he felt like a large predator was around and following him. He suspected it to be a mountain lion at first, but wasn't too sure. He kept a pistol at his belt at all times, just in case, to deter any unwanted animals. He shot it up in the air to try and scare away anything that was around. That is, when he heard a low snarl from behind a tree. He pointed his pistol, ready for whatever was behind. Out steps these two canine beings, the same ones my granddad had been seeing. These beings come out of the brush and come toward his brother. His brother fled never said anything to my granddad and just left. Whatever these things were, they were causing him serious issues. He told me he felt desperate and not sure where to turn to try and rid these things off of his land. He had called the police for an intruder on his property and they had basically told him to just install security to help. After these beings constantly being around his property, he decided to go stay at a friend's house indefinitely. The house is paid off in full and has been for a long time. Letting it sit there for a while isn't going to be too bad. But he decided after staying at this friend's house for around two weeks, it was time to tough things out for the better. Upon coming back to his house and land, for the first time in a while he said he felt a sense of peace. Listening closely to his surroundings, he could hear birds chirping in the distance. This gave him hope. After a few days, things seemed to have calmed down. Perhaps these beings moved out of the area. He's not sure. Eventually, weeks went on and there were virtually zero sign of these beings being around at all. He even was able to borrow a truck to get his tractor moved and bought a newer one. His farm went to hell for a while because he wasn't able to maintain anything. He had to start over for a lot of things. He never did find what happened to his truck, game cams, and bear traps. He felt like he could finally start over again, and he did. He still lives there to this day, and says he hasn't had a single encounter with anything that stands out. Normally I'd call him a bullshitter, but he's a stern, serious individual. He would have put so much time into faking the story. When he told it to me, he spent a couple of hours diving into every little detail. So, I apologize for only writing to you what I can remember. There's no way he would have just come up with something like that. I am also an avid cryptozoology researcher, so when he told me about this happening, I just wanted to hear more. I believe, based off his account, that it is indeed a form of dogman. When I kept asking for him to describe these beings to me, he just kept pointing back to the Anubis Egyptian god. This only happened 12 years ago. My father, I, and my younger sister were driving back and forth between Washington State and Idaho. We were in the process of moving to central Idaho from eastern Washington since my dad started a new career out there. We were traveling with him, making multiple trips, 
getting everything we had from the old house. This was in the springtime. The only reason I remember that is because it was rainy. Things were very lush and green, and all the flowers were in full bloom. I'm unsure if that has any effect at all on the actual reason behind what happened, but just something to note. My sister and I were in the back seat. I think she was sleeping, I'm not sure. I was just bored, looking out my side of the window. My dad had the radio going, listening to music I didn't like. Half paying attention, my eyes catch what looks to be a really, really large black bear, sitting or maybe crouching a little bit up on this hill right by a large boulder and trees, just watching the road intently. Black bears are pretty common up here in the northwestern area of this country. I wasn't surprised, but as I looked more and more, I could see that there were details of whatever it was I was looking at that didn't look normal. It looked unusually large and muscular. As we drove, because the angle it was at, we were kind of getting closer to it, giving me a better look. It indeed was crouching and looked like a large dark-colored dog, not a bear. Its head really resembled that of a German shepherd, or a wolf, I guess. Wild hair, large ears. It was oddly shaped too. As I'm saying this, I mentioned to my dad that there's a large bear, dog thing, up on the hill watching traffic. My dad, totally off in his own world, just responds with, That's nice, son. I rolled my eyes, and I kept watching it until we drove out of sight. It barely moved its head, but was focused on watching traffic the entire time. We had driven this road multiple times in the past week, and I seriously doubted what I was seeing was ever there before. I was sure I would have noticed it before. I don't think I put too much thought into what it really was. Life just kind of went on and I forgot about it. I did think about it though from time to time, thinking I had seen a strange, possibly unknown species of animal, but I was never sure. About eight or nine years ago, after learning about so many resources online about strange animals and sightings, began my obsession for answers. The closest that I could come up with that is remotely close to what others describe as the dogman. I didn't get enough clear details of its body to accurately and for sure say that that is what I saw, although much of the details of the head are spot on with some dogman descriptions. There's even an actual account that I read a few years back, I can't remember where, but a person in Tennessee having an almost identical situation to what happened to me driving around with their family and saw a dogman-like humanoid watching the highway. I thought that to be a pretty trippy thing. I can't say for sure these are dogmen, but it is for sure something out of the realm of our normal. I've never seen an animal like that. I know it wasn't a bear, it wasn't a wolf, and it was not a dog. Its shape was too weird, and the size was all off. I'm probably not the only one who had seen it either. It was daytime, and there was traffic on the road. Anyone who looked over to the right in the correct spot would have seen it sitting up there watching traffic. Like many encounters, I read through and see, many have very negative experiences with these beings. I wasn't scared or anything. It just makes me curious about the aspect of nature we know nothing about, which is a lot. Think of all the undiscovered species in the world that we don't even know about yet. In fact, I think it was only a few years back, scientists discovered a plethora of undiscovered species of animal off an island of Madagascar or something like that. You'll have to Google it, I don't remember. Maybe as more and more people have sightings and encounters, we can finally begin to put together piece by piece what exactly we have in our midst. I was coming home one night from hanging out with a few buddies for dinner and some drinks. I spent some time at the bar with a couple of old friends that I hadn't seen in forever. So we had dinner, had a couple beers, and catched up for a while. Eventually, we left the bar at around 2 in the morning, heading home and wishing each other well. I'm beyond sober at this point, since I stopped drinking at around 8 or 9 because I didn't want to be anywhere near intoxicated on the road. I get to my house, I think it was around 2.18 in the morning. 
Where my house is, I have a long concrete driveway. I mean, I guess not really long, but enough you could fit four cars until you get to the garage door. On my right side is nothing but tall hedges. For height, I would estimate maybe 12 feet. They spanned the entire length of the driveway, up past my house. I'm getting out of my car, and I'm walking up the driveway. Before I continue, I should state that I park my work truck, so I was parked behind that. This meant I had probably a 30-foot walk to my front door. I'm getting out of the car. It's dark and quite late. It's quiet around too. I turn to lock my car, and that's when I notice this head staring at me. My eyes, still adjusting to the darkness around me, had to squint to fully make out what I was looking at. I see the silhouette shape of a dog head. German Shepherd, as a matter of fact. Then I see these faintly glowing amber eyes just locked onto me. As soon as I digested the fact that it was indeed a dog head that was that high up in the hedges, and those were its eyes, this awful wave of dread just washed over me. I felt my blood run cold. I turned around and got to my front door faster than I ever have. I'm no runner by any means, but I felt like I could have won a gold medal on the track team. I locked my door and stayed up for hours waiting for whatever it was that I saw to show itself. I never saw it reveal itself. I watched and watched from my window and never saw anything. My front porch light was enough for me to see if there was anything to come out of the hedges. Due to the angle, I couldn't see anything inside of the hedges. Where I was looking was straight down my driveway, through my front window, so the hedges were perpendicular to the window. I've told this story to some of my close friends and they just laugh. Honestly, I don't know what it was. The overall size of the thing's head wasn't normal. It had the shape of a shaggy dog and resembled a German Shepherd, but I know those dogs don't get that big. Plus, I had to look up at these eyes, which no dog that I know has glowing amber eyes like that. It wasn't dramatically glowing, but glowing enough that it looked demonic and caught my attention. I just knew deep down in my gut that it wasn't a dog. It was something else. I believe it was a demon of some sort. I am not a religious person, but what I felt in that moment was pure evil. Taking a friend home from a long day of drama with an ex-girlfriend of his. He didn't have a car at the time, and I was happy to give him a lift. I came and picked him up, and drove him back to his place, which was about 45 minutes away in total. He lives way out there so it's quite a beautiful drive, night or daytime. At the time it was dark outside, but the sun hadn't fully set just yet. You could still drive without your headlights and probably be fine. Somewhere along the road, on the side of the tall grass, we saw this dog-like human form walking upright at a fast pace, going up a ridge. The animal crossed the road quickly in a stride or two, and up the ridge to our right. It was in full view for a second, maybe two, illuminated by my headlights. I'm not a good estimator of distance, but if I had to guess, maybe 50 yards. It was far enough we weren't going to hit it, but close enough that we could see that it clearly was a humanoid-looking wolf walking on two legs. It was also very large, tall and skinny, I'd guess eight or so feet. Its waist was slim but had an entirely human body. The only thing it didn't have was a human head. The head was that of a timber wolf. It's like if you took a wolf's head and stuck it on top of the body of a man. Then cover that man in the same kind of fur a wolf has and there you go. Its fur was very dark in color. It looked to be black but I could be mistaken. I didn't see the hands or feet, but it had longer, slimmer arms and legs. It was covered completely in this thick hair and had a very human gait to it. The way it moved gave us the impression it was kind of gliding across the road. It was very strange. I've never seen anything glide like that, alive or not. 
I don't recall seeing any facial details. I don't think it ever noticed our oncoming vehicle. It made no signs of noticing or acknowledging that we were coming up the road. It seemed to be on a mission though, knowing where it was going to. We slowed down to watch it go up the ridge, but it went out of sight so quickly. As we drove right by where it passed the road, we slowed down and our windows were open. A very strong, unpleasant odor of rotting meat and wet dog wafted through the car. It was strong. The best way to describe it to you is like opening a dumpster with rotting meat or fish in it. If you live near a lake or park on a lake, you might know what I'm talking about. It's like that. Opening the lid and this mass of putrefaction hitting you in the face all at once. We both gagged, but it only lingered for maybe five seconds. But gosh, it was strong. We still talk about it to this day. Have no idea what it was. I recently took this girl out that I've been seeing for a few months now, since the fall. I took her out to my city's waterfront, which is beautiful, by the way. Even in the winter time, when there's not really many people around, it kind of makes for a little more romance. As we're sitting there, chit-chatting on the bench, she looks over and points off in the distance. She and I both double-take as we have to make real of what we're seeing. Far away is this really big person with the head of a dog. The legs even looked like a dog. It was dark in color. I couldn't tell from that far away. My date and I just sat there and gasped in awe at what we were seeing. This was a real-life creature in the flesh. It was darting back and forth between the trees, acting somewhat stealthy. There's seldom lights over in that direction, but it just so happened to be in the right spot and looking at the right time to catch it. It looked to be this big shape moving around, which would sometimes move close enough to the light to be able to make out minute details. Again, from the distance, things were kind of hard to tell for sure. I don't know much about things that go bump in the night, other than it was as spooky as it was interesting. My girlfriend and I still talk about it sometimes, trying to guess what it was. Let me first explain that every Christmas, my family has a massive get-together where everyone flies out. We all meet up at my grandmother's house for a few days and just do general Christmas stuff. It's been an ongoing tradition for years and years. Due to this, I am now very close with many of my family that I wouldn't normally see all year round and can actually keep relationships. My cousin, who lives up on the East Coast in Eastern Pennsylvania, is quite the character. I'll call him Dan for this story. Dan has told me some interesting information, and him and I are very close, like I said. I feel like he is able to fully confide in me. He knows that I know he is rational and not crazy. It took him a couple of drinks to really open up and tell me what happened. Even as he was telling me, he got shaken up. His attitude and demeanor changed, and that's why, ultimately, I believe him. You can't fake a reaction like what I witnessed of his. Unless, of course, he's an Oscar award-winning actor. I don't know if you want to call it a cabin, but he owns this little house about 50 or so miles away from his own. This cabin, we'll call it, is tucked away thick into the Tioga State Forest. There's no running water, no electricity. I'm not even sure who really knows about it. He built this cabin himself years ago when he was younger as a getaway for him. I've been to it before, it's pretty well built, but doesn't have much to it. Now that you understand that portion, the next portion is essentially what he explained to me. During this time, it was just him and I sitting together outside with the rest of the family inside. I was smoking a cigarette, and he just got lost in conversation when he started to tell me about it asking me if I could listen to what he had to say and believe it. He told me that he was up there with this girl he's been dating back in September. I guess they went on a few days of a vacation getaway. Sometime during the night, they were startled by a noise outside. Thinking it was just an animal, they ignored it and tried to go back to sleep. 
This animal, or whatever it was outside, continuously acted more and more aggressive to the point to where the front door was forced and broken down and this animal entered the cabin. This is the part where my cousin has a really hard time retelling and shuts down. He says as it broke into the cabin, it was like this large hairy wolf creature. It had too many teeth for its mouth, all razor sharp and glowing eyes. The fear alone he felt nearly drove him insane. His eyes were welting up and he was holding back tears as he's explaining this to me. Says it must have been the grace of God that allowed him to escape without getting mauled. His woman and he were able to manage to get into his car and getting out of there before this thing got to them. What I didn't quite understand myself was how if it broke into the cabin, how it wasn't able to get to him and his girlfriend in time, but I didn't want to keep pushing information out of him when it was clearly traumatic. He did break down at the end, telling me about this, and he just kept saying, I didn't think things like that existed in our woods. Why did nobody ever tell me about these things? Why does everyone tell you monsters don't exist? It scared me to the core to see how much it was affecting him. I tried to quickly change the subject and bring him out of it, which took a little bit, but worked eventually. I wanted to know more, but it was too hard on him. I'm scared because I don't know what on earth he saw out there. It makes me very hesitant to ever step foot in the woods myself and if that kind of animal is truly lurking around. As he finished up his story, I was silent. How do you even respond to somebody telling you that and reacting the way he did? It ruined my night. Not only to know that those kind of monsters exist, but to see my cousin so distraught over something that happened months ago, he probably hasn't even been back. I do talk to him often on Facebook, but I really just don't have the heart to ask him more about it and put him through that pain again. I went fishing with a buddy a few summers back by a creek we always like to visit. It's a great spot and if you trek in just a small way, you'll reach a spot that not many know about. It's got plenty of shade and plenty of fish too. It's been a favorite spot between my buddy and I for quite some time now. We've been going to it for years. This time we showed up there, there was something there. I don't know how to put it into words other than a wolf-man hybrid. I know it might sound crazy, but that's exactly what this thing looked like. We're coming up to our fishing spot, and both my friend and I stopped dead in our tracks. We saw it before it saw us. We still had our fishing poles in hand, maybe not even 50 yards from the spot. It was in our spot, kneeling down looking into the river. It looked like maybe it was going to grab a fish. After a second or two, it lifted its head up, sniffing the air and turned to look at us. That's the first time my friend and I really got a good look at this thing, whatever it was. Its size alone was intimidating to say the least. It freakishly resembled the werewolves of the Underworld movies quite well. It stares at us for a second, then jumps off across the river in the trees, and then it's just gone. Never made much of a sound. For something of that sheer size to just gracefully go through the woods without noise is otherworldly. My friend and I stood there with our jaws on the ground, wanting to know what the hell was that thing. We were a little shaken up, but mostly just in sheer shock of what happened. We spent the rest of the day fishing and talking about it, hoping it would come back so we could get a better look at it. It never did. We have been back to that spot since then and have never seen it again. I almost wonder if it was trying to grab a fish and we spooked it by coming up on it. I don't know how it didn't hear us beforehand. We were casually having a conversation and walking with equipment on not being mindful at all of trying to be quiet. I had a nightmarish experience when I was much younger. I was in my early 20s at the time and driving around exploring in my beat up 1990 Ford F-250. That thing has zero suspension 
so when you drove over bumps and humps, you as hell felt it. That truck, though, that truck could take a beating, which is why I drove it out all over the place. I would often try and drive down old abandoned roads, logging roads, and any other roads that had been deemed unsafe or had been left for some time. I just loved exploring. There would be days I would explore old game trails off of logging roads for miles on end. No, not in my truck, on foot of course. But this particular time, I was exploring around the mountains near me, where there are many logging roads that I hadn't even explored yet. One of them I drove down was very long and windy, and I came upon a large timber clearing, maybe five or so football fields in length, or size at least. My attention is immediately pulled to my left, where not far away, I see these huge black wolves ripping this full-blown bull elk to pieces, just ripping chunks of meat right off of its flesh. It was already dead and was probably a fresh kill. I slow down to a crawl, trying to see what the hell kind of wolves those are when they all look up at me, at my truck, in unison. I knew right then and there, these were not wolves. These were ugly motherfuckers. Their faces resembled that of a hyena mixed with a wolf. Very scary and very fierce looking faces. All of them had the most piercing of yellow eyes. That's when all of them probably eight or nine stand up on their hind legs and start to slowly walk towards my truck, as if angry at the aggressor who just interrupted their meal. I slam on reverse as hard as I can and I'm flying so hard through that logging road in reverse. I'm amazed my axles came back in one piece. They should have been busted or bent from how hard I was going and hitting bumps. I get back to the main road and I'm not even looking back to see if they followed me. Hell no. To think back on something I've tried to shun out of my mind now for well over 20 years is painful. It was so frightening. There's nights I don't sleep well and have reoccurring nightmares, and I just go back to thinking about these things. The sheer power of these animals. It was like I was in an African safari, watching lions rip the meat off a zebra. The power these animals had to just rip huge chunks of meat off this big bull elk, like it was Play-Doh. Had I stuck around and they got to me, I probably would have been next on the dinner menu. I'll end my story with an interesting piece of information I found out much later on. I don't hunt myself, but I have many friends that do and have for a very long time in the area. I guess the game hunting in that area isn't near as good as it used to be. Much of the elk that populated the area has dwindled significantly in population, along with the deer population in the last 10 years. There has not been enough of an increase in poaching or legal hunting to justify that much of a loss in both species. Many speculate both deer and elk have moved out of the area, most likely due to an unseen predator like mountain lions. The problem is no one has really seen a mountain lion around in the area for quite some time. I guess they're pretty rare, and we got a bunch of critters down this way. I speculate that there's probably more of those wolf things around, and they might, just might be a contributing factor to the ever-declining elk and deer population. This is just my perspective. It was Mother's Day in 2015, and I was coming back from taking my mother to a day at the beach. My dad passed away years ago, and my mom and I still remain really close. I don't live near my mother. My career actually takes me across the US, so I live in states away with my own life, but love to reconnect with her as much as I can. This Mother's Day was special. I treated her out to a wonderful day on the coast, went and did a bunch of sightseeing that we don't normally get to see. The day went wonderful. We were driving back to her house to relax for the evening when my mom is really fixated on something outside of her window. We're driving on a long, winding road, and I asked her what she's looking at, and she keeps asking me if I saw that. I asked her, see what? I look over, and out of the tall grass see this large dog-like shape coming out of the brush 
and back into the trees like it was looking for something. That's what it was acting like, at least. Both my mother and I were puzzled at what we were looking at. Keep in mind, I couldn't keep direct eye contact on it like my mother could since I was driving. I don't know if anybody else saw it, though. It was in the evening time, so it was just now starting to get dark. We both clearly saw something we could not explain that looked canine-like. I have no idea what it could have been. The shape didn't make sense. It wasn't exactly the shape of a dog wandering around, and it wasn't exactly the shape of a person, either. It was something in between. It was large. Large enough to easily be the size of a bear, but it didn't look anything like a bear. It moved oddly, almost as if it was in a gliding motion. At first, my mom thought it was some kind of bear until we realized the head and the snout and the ears were that of a dog. Mother and I were more puzzled than anything else and weren't sure why it kept coming out of the brush, looking down at the ground. Was it following a mouse? It was odd behavior. I thought I'd send this story to you anyway because it was weird and seems to fall with some of the stuff you talk about on your show. I was on a fishing trip with my uncle. I normally am not up for that sort of thing, but come on, the man was dying of cancer. He had spent most of his life trying to get me to like fishing, and he had all but failed. So, his wishes were that I would go fishing with him, and at least pretend to be enjoying myself. I couldn't say no to something like that, especially under those circumstances. I met my uncle on his own property. He owned the better part of three smaller lakes in Tennessee. Well, they weren't really lakes. They were more like oversized ponds. Not recognized as lakes by any stretch of the means. It was the kind of land that you could just live off of and just forget about any concept of an outside world with cares and problems and troubles. That was pretty much what my uncle had done. He got wrapped up in spending all of his free time, lost in the fantasy world of fishing, until the reality of the disease came calling, leading his mortality on a leash. And somewhere, in all of that, one of the first things he had thought of was me. So, how do I say no to something like that? We pushed off and got rather far away from shore. I had forgotten just how much land my uncle had truly owned. My uncle sat back in the little rowboat and tipped his hat over his eyes and fell asleep. I shook my head and ceased pretending to be interested whether my fishing line really got anything or not. I loved the man, but the business of becoming a vegetable while waiting for a fish to take bait just really wasn't my thing. I was lost in a restless daydream when my line not only went taut, but the entire rod was yanked out of the boat. It took me one second too long to respond and the whole thing was now lost in the water. I couldn't imagine what sort of thing was big enough to take away my uncle's equipment so quickly and with so much force. Unfortunately, I wouldn't have to imagine very long. Somewhere, in the cloak of the mist that hugged the water, I heard what sounded to be a great deal of splashing. Then, I heard growling, mingled with a yelping sound. Something was in pain, and it didn't sound like a fish. Then, came a very frustrated howl, as two points of dim light danced somewhere in the gray void. I did the dumb thing, and I began to row toward it. Heedles of the possibility of coming across a raving lunatic or a pack of wild animals that could be panicked and dangerous if they were caught up in the fishing line. I had hoped that the two points of light were an indicator of people, but they were far, far from it. Well, they turned out to be eyes. It was like something from an old cartoon that I used to watch when I was a kid. A towering monster, a wolf thing, 
that had gotten the hook sunk into its body and was having a dickens of time getting it out. Its clawed fingers weren't suited for the fine manipulation it would take to work a small but sturdy hook out of its body and was getting now stuck in the line. The thing was visibly angry and perhaps distraught. The sight of it alone was terrifying and had I been more attuned to animals, I might have had a mind to help it if it didn't stand more than seven feet tall and walk around like you or I. What kind of wolf creature walks around on its hind legs? Werewolves, that's what. But I had absolutely no preparation in my mind for ever running into such a thing, so I was speechless and directionless. I ended up rowing away quietly, hoping that it wouldn't catch our scent and come after us. It bolted off into the woods, with the line still wrapped around it. I had a hell of a time explaining to my uncle what happened to his fishing gear when he woke up. I should clarify that this thing clearly looked strong enough to break the line, but that didn't seem to be the problem. The hook seemed to be lodged somewhere in its chest. I don't know how or what, but it seemed like it was having a really hard time digging it out, being halfway into the water in the mist, and I don't know why it bolted away or why it didn't come after us. Either way, it was completely and absolutely frightening. I'm just glad my uncle didn't see it. The poor old man would have probably had a heart attack. A few years ago, a whole bunch of us went camping. There were nine of us altogether. Six guys, three girls, and we shared three big tents between us. We were all of college age, and there was a lot of drinking, flirting, and just fun times all around. On that first morning, the girls all complained that one of the guys had used the outside of their tent as a toilet during the night. Now, most of us had a little too much to drink, but not one of us could recall doing anything as gross as that. Three out of the six admitted that they'd woken up to pee during the night, but all claimed to have used the trees, and two even said, despite the hour and grogginess, they'd taken some water to wash the nastiness away. We might have been young and foolish, but none of us were that gross, and we all kind of liked these girls anyway. And if anything, we wanted to impress them, not mark our territory on their tent. Next morning, same complaint. The girls swore they'd been woken up to the sound of somebody urinating on the side of the tent. It was so loud and such a powerful flow, it had woken them up from a deep sleep. They'd almost come out of the tent and confronted whoever it was, but they were all too tired and it was too cold. It was also raining. This time, none of the guys could remember getting up to use the tree bathroom. One had woken up early, like 5 a.m. to go, but the girls said this was in the middle of the night. They were getting a bit annoyed, and there was definitely the strong smell of pee on the tent, but it kind of had a weird smell to it. Not human urine. It kind of had a smell that I can't quite describe. We washed it away and wondered if we had a liar or more likely a sleep peer in our midst. One of the guys actually made the sensible suggestion that the most plausible explanation was that it was indeed an animal, especially considering the smell, like I just said, wasn't quite human smelling. Something that came over to the campsite on the night to scavenge for leftovers, and then left a little thank you. The girls scoffed at this, though as they said the flow had been so loud the previous night that they could actually tell where it was hitting the fabric, and there's no animal that big or that stood up to pee like a dude. They actually insisted we all use the bathroom on the site, not the trees, before we hit the sack on our final night. They were pissed, 
and it was clear that none of us were in their good books, as we were all suspects. We also decided the only way to unmask the villain was as soon as the girls heard the noise, they were to yell, and we'd look out in our tents to see which one of us was missing. Sure enough again, around 2.30 a.m., there was a loud enough to wake the dead and yell and a scream. I woke up super fast and shone the light in my tent. One, two, and three. So it wasn't any of us. I heard scrambling in the other guy tent and a shout, not us. Screw this, I thought. Opened the tent flap and quickly shone my light at the girls. I heard another scream as I caught the culprit in my flash beam. At first, I thought it was a tweaker. They were really tall and skinny and had their back to me, which I hadn't noticed in the shock of seeing somebody actually there in the darkness that was this person, covered in thick gray and brown hair. And then, they, or it, or whatever the hell you call it, looked at me. It screamed. I screamed. The girls then screamed. Except this thing wasn't screaming because it was scared. It was a very intimidating, angry scream. Like half human, half animal being hurt. It was the most disturbing thing I've ever seen. The only way I can describe it is it was very slender, very skinny, very hairy, with the head that looked just like a dog's. It was really gross looking, and despite it having this messed up head, it had this horrifying scream, a nasty, terrifying noise. Once I got over the initial shock, I leapt out of the tent. To be honest, I don't know exactly what I intended to do, but I felt like I should do something. Luckily, rather than launch into an attack, it screamed even more and then ran off. And when I say ran, this thing was like the flash. It was there one moment, then poof, gone. It was so fast it was almost unnatural. The girls were in hysterics, and I wasn't far behind. The guys, on the other hand, in the tent, hadn't gotten the best look, but had just caught a glimpse of the thing before it ran, just like the wind. The girls all swore up and down. They wanted to leave, but we managed to placate them by spreading them out into the two guy tents, just until the sun rose, and we had enough light to pack up safely. Whatever that thing was, it was messed up. The only saving grace was that it genuinely didn't seem to want to hurt us. Maybe it was marking its territory. I don't know. But who knows what might have happened if there hadn't been so many people. I know one thing is for certain, and that's that we will never choose that spot to go camping again. This isn't my story, but my great-grandfather's. During the time of Prohibition, where government men roamed the hills of the wilderness, looking for moonshine stills to cut down, my great-grandfather, whom we'll call Albert, was one of the more successful revenuers. He had an intuition that didn't lie, whereas them hillbillies used the land to warn themselves of oncoming types like Albert, such as by noting the wildlife getting real, real quiet, real quick, or there being bursts of birds in the air or squirrels running from one direction. Albert knew how to muffle his steps and not to set off any awareness. Or if he did, he did it in such a way that threw people off as to what he was actually up to. One thing he learned for sure was that there was no way to move across the land in perfect silence. The hills were alive, and every step had some sort of effect. It either reacted to your movement or your presence. There was never no reaction at all. So, Albert was closing in 
on one of the biggest moonshine operations he had been commissioned to take down, and it would mean putting a dent in as much as 23% of the current flow of booze from these hills. He was pretty sure he had bagged them down one day when he spotted thick columns of smoke in the sky. Maybe they just had gotten careless. It didn't matter. He had a promotion to collect if he could make this one job count. He wasn't able to read the land like he should have. That much smoke had to have mean that there was a disaster, and a disaster meant that there should have been more scramble of human activity to get it under control. But the hills weren't agitated above more than average. This puzzled Albert greatly, and for the first time, he was very apprehensive. He found the property. There was one or two stills in a wood, but the real work was being done in an unusually long barn where three stills were in full production. The fires for all three were burning out of control and whomever owned the barn was about to lose it. Amidst all the smoke and chaos, Albert spotted no less than four bodies all around the perimeter of the barn. They weren't overwhelmed by smoke. They were ripped open and clawed up, looking like the work of a bear, except bears eat what they kill. These poor souls were just mauled and left. Albert approached the barn door just in time to be knocked aside by another man firing a shotgun like a nut. Somehow, both slugs missed Albert, but he wasn't sure if he was even the target. That's when he saw a furry shape, moving too quickly to see, had jumped out of the barn and was on the shotgun man in a blur. Albert watched in horror as this monstrous looking thing that looked to be half man, half wolf, made quick work of the panicked man. It shook Albert up pretty bad. He said he could hear the man's screams in his sleep, clear up until the day he had died. He dealt with that trauma for a long time. He always got very serious when he brought up the half man, half wolf thing and said it wasn't at all like the 1950s horror movie, The Wolfman. He said this was much more barbaric, animalistic, and terrifying. He was about to get his revolver out and put a few shots into this beast, but that didn't put it down. It only seemed to piss it off more before it bounded off into the woods. It let out a horrifying howl and wailed the whole way. And for some reason, it's not the cry that haunted Albert for years to come. I guess the government had seized all the property because, well, I guess there was nobody left alive to put up a fuss. Thoroughly retaken, it eventually ended up being Albert's property towards the end of his tenure. He tried to make a home out of it, but it just had too much baggage with it. He eventually sold it and used the money to buy himself some place a bit smaller and more isolated. My grandfather, Albert, didn't have one good night of sleep the rest of his life. I've heard this story so many times growing up, and even more so before he died. I'm pretty sure he just wanted to make sure that it was never forgotten about. He tells me that he wasn't sure why this thing let him live, because it could have easily mauled him just like it mauled the five other men before him. And this thing did some pretty nasty damage, he told me. It was pretty gory. He never went into great depth of detail about what the bodies looked like or the true damage that had been done. But he always compared it to a nasty bear kill. And it's quite obvious how nasty bears can kill and maul a person, let alone an animal, even before they decide to eat it. I'm writing in to tell you about something that I saw last night on my way home from a drive-in. It was dark, and there are a hell of a lot of trees, either side of the road, but I know what I saw. Well, I don't know what it is, but I know that I saw it. 
I had my headlights on, because, as I said, it was dark, and this part of the road seems dark, even in the daytime because of the trees. I could just about make out the head, a very, very weird shape in the middle of the road. This isn't wholly unusual. There are all sorts of animals out here at night, and after all, many are nocturnal, so this is really their time. I guess they thought that I was the one that shouldn't be there. So I hit the horn a couple of times and flashed my brights. But that's usually more than enough to scare off any kind of critter. But it didn't move. It just stood there. I began thinking the other obvious point. Whatever it was was now dead. That left me with the dilemma of whether I could get the car around it when all of a sudden, this thing got up. I won't repeat exactly what I thought, but you can bet there was a whole bunch of cursing and screaming coming out of my mouth. Because in front of me, I could see pretty clearly now, was some sort of really tall hyena creature. And when I say tall, I mean like really tall, like a person. Basically, in front of me, clear in the headlights, was a hyena that stood up on two legs, just like a person, complete with that sort of weird spotty hair they got, and a weird face with a sort of arched back. It was definitely hyena-like, but it looked wrong, and it stood on two legs, which was wrong to begin with. It seemed to stand its ground as I got closer. I have to admit in my shock and panic, I was just heading towards it still. No thoughts of slowing down. At the last minute, literally, right before I would have mowed it down, it jumped out of the way and sped off far into the trees. I just kept driving. I needed to. I needed to get home before I could really allow myself to think about what I just saw. Was it a dog man? I don't know. It didn't look like a dog. It was pure hyena. So, a hyena man? I just don't know. Which is why I'm telling you. To see what you and the people that listen to your show think. Thanks for taking the time to read my story. My dad loves to hunt. We live just outside of Denver and there are a lot of different things that he can shoot at. He even works in an outdoor store, so he justifies hours killing animals by saying it's research for the store, and he is trialing the goods to let the customers know just how good or not good they work. Whatever. I'm not really anti-hunting, or even that bothered about him being away for hours at the weekend as it is usually really early in the morning, and I'm too busy sleeping. Thankfully, my younger brother is more into it than me, so if Dad fancies company, it's my brother that gets woken up at like 3 a.m., not me. One rule my mother always insisted on is that my dad comes home clean. We all know what he does, but she doesn't want his bloody cargoes coming back into the house so he goes to the store after a hunt and cleans up. And if he has brought back a kill, it has to be dealt with first. She has no qualms about cooking up whatever the hell he's shot, but won't entertain the idea of skinning it and chopping it up. It's like if it's presented to her in neat steaks, she can pretend it's some chicken or beef she bought at the store, not like bobcat or bear or something. I learned a long time ago not to ask what I was eating. Dad has only ever broken the rule of coming home clean once, and that's the tale I'm going to tell you about. It was just a regular Sunday morning in the fall. He'd headed out nice and early to catch whatever it was, a deer, a boar, or something, and was planning on heading back in time for lunch and the game. Josh and I, 
my brother, by the way, had enjoyed a lie and some video games in the morning while mom was fixing food. It was still a couple of hours until my father was due back. So when the back door swung open and he was covered in blood and a loaded shotgun still in hand, that was mom's over, but actually more important rule. No guns in the house. They were to be stored in a locked cabinet in the garage. We were all stunned. My brother was more used to seeing dad like that than anybody. And afterwards, even he said he'd never seen so much blood. My mother was starting to get mad, and she seemed worried, asking dad if the blood was his. That seemed to be the only reasonable explanation as to why he would take a 20-year promise of not wearing his hunting stuff in the house. I remember him shaking his head, said he wasn't hurt, the blood was not his. That was when mom started to get mad again. Dad, however, seemed to totally ignore her and sat down at the table, still bloody, and placed the gun down. I asked my father what was going on. This was in no way normal, completely out of his character. He might have taught me how to load a gun almost before I could ride a bike, but gun safety was the law and I had never seen this gun in the house. I'd asked him a second time what had happened. He gave me a look, almost as if seeing me for the first time. He picked up the gun, emptying the shells, placing it back on the table. At this point, I think my mother relented and realized something weird was going on. Like, properly weird. She even asked what had happened. Then my father proceeded to tell us what had happened. He said he'd been stalking whatever animal he was looking for, and he'd been about to shoot when he heard a really loud noise. My father's kind of a mountain man. He doesn't really scare easy. The woods have really desensitized him, and he had his gun. But he is also very smart. He's not an idiot. He immediately went into defensive mode and tried to locate where the noise had come from that he had never heard before. He was also trying to identify it. He said it sounded kind of like a wild dog, but had a very distinct timbre to the noise. He had crouched down, aimed in the general direction the noise was coming from, and stayed solemnly still. The noise, what he could make out to be a very, very low-pitched growling sound, was then joined by a loud roaring, a really odd, deep, guttural roar, which was quickly followed by what sounded like a screeching sound. Still, with the gun pointed in the general direction where the noise appeared to be centered, he started to quietly creep towards it. And then... Dad told us exactly what was making that noise. As he rounded the trees that had been covering what he now presumed to be a wild dog, he had his gun pointed down towards the floor, because that was obviously where he expected the creature to be. What he had not expected, and would have never imagined in his wildest dreams, was that this dog that he was about to meet would actually be bigger and larger than him, and even reared up on two legs. Oh, and there were two of them. The roaring and growling and screeching. That's right. They stood just a few feet in front of him. Two things that can only be what I know to be dogmen. Tall. Much taller than my dad. He is six foot fair. But my dad can only think to protect himself against something like this. Something big, broad, jet black, and faces that he said resembled Doberman pinchers, which I thought was interesting. He blasted his shotgun and hit both at least once, hence the blood. They both turned and ran, and he ran back to his truck, straight home. He was telling us he had never felt such primal fear in his life. He's experienced 
he knows to never run from predatory animals. But he said he's never had this kind of primal fear overtake him before. My brother might be 12, but he began to cry. Mom looked like she wanted to join in. I think I even considered it. In a way, our shocked response seemed to be what Dad needed. He suddenly shot up from the table and said he was going to go to the store, scooped up the gun, and apologized, and without saying anything else, left. Those next few hours were brutal, but finally Dad came back home, along with a couple of his friends. They'd been back to the exact spot, but unable to find these things. They knew it was the right spot, because there was a lot of blood, surprisingly. There was even a trail of blood, but it stopped, and there were no bodies to be found. They had looked all around for a few hours, but didn't see or hear anything. Nothing. Not even the sound of another creature or bird. In fact, the entire time, the woods felt eerie and even deathly quiet. They've been back several times, but these dogmen, to what I know, have never been spotted a second time. My father thinks he must have killed them, and maybe another animal had dragged them off, because things just don't disappear. But then, six-foot, two-legged dogs don't exist either. I know about cryptids, and so I knew exactly what this was. But my dad doesn't even believe in Bigfoot, so I think he was the most shocked by all of this. My brother and mother both think it's all hogwash too, but they can't deny my father's genuine reaction of fear and worry, hence why they're scared. I'm not even sure what to make of it myself. Not that I don't believe my dad, and not that I don't believe dogmen exist. It just seems so surreal that my own father would have a run-in with these supposed mystical creatures. I did a really stupid thing and fell asleep in a boat on the bayous. Considering that the gators and croc population was up in those days, that was an especially stupid thing for me to do. But I had been drinking, and the swamp sounds had been so soothing. I felt succumbed to the relaxation and conked out. I woke up to the sight of what looked like logs with eyes drifting all around me. I knew that if I started rowing, those logs would beeline me, and I'd be in for a world of trouble. I hoped they would go away on their own. That turned out to be a very foolish hope. The exact opposite happened. One of them got tired of waiting and started carving V-shaped ripples as it headed straight for me. Now, maybe it was the liquor or the hangover from it, but I watched as that crocodile, or alligator, whatever it is, came straight for me, and I was ready to go. But then there was a ripple on the surface and some bubbles, and the alligator, or whatever, was gone. Stranger yet, the others started fleeing from my location. I was expecting the once submerged alligator to launch itself out of the water, and slam itself into my boat. Instead, it emerged on a far bank, and it looked like it was scrambling for its life. I kid you not, a large black clawed hand reached out of the water and grabbed its tail and yanked it back under the water with such incredible force that this thing stood no chance. Now, I don't know how much you know about the autonomy of an alligator, but the tail ain't the weakest part of their body, by far. The simple fact that this animal is wrestled back into the water by its tail, with one hand at that, raised some serious questions about what sort of thing or person was manhandling it. A few moments later, I could see there was no man to do the manhandling. The chaotic splashing drifted over to the bank where I can only describe it as a towering monster 
that looked like a wolf, coated in slime, emerged with an iron grip on the croc's dead body. Thrash as it may, there was just no escaping, and it was one of the bigger alligators I had ever seen. For a moment, I thought the whole thing would turn around with the alligator it got in its jaws and the large head of a monster, but the thing took its two massive claws and grabbed either side of the mouth and pulled it open very wide. I could hear the jaws snap, and I knew right away the animal had been broken. This hulking wolf monster then proceeded to bash its prey against a tree and rage. Ever see a croc get its brains beaten out? I did that day. It was as terrific as it was terrifying. Even though I stood to be lunch just a few minutes earlier, I couldn't help but feel sorry. It literally had no fighting chance and might as well have been a puppy in the clutches of an eagle. If you'd met me, you'd see that my hands shake. It's why my voice shakes too. I came so close to death, and then I watched death incarnate, in the flesh, rise up and break a predator that I feared, as if it were just a mere toy. This is why I stay out of the bayous. I've heard tales of what people describe as hulking-sized werewolves, but I always just thought it was wives' tales. Silly ghost stories to scare kids that are told around the campfire. That is, until I saw it for myself. I was more amazed at the sheer size of this animal, or creature, or thing. It was kind of like a human, except nearly eight to nine feet tall, with a massive Arnold Schwarzenegger-like body, covered in thick, long, black hair with the massive head of that of a wolf. To say it was a werewolf, well, I don't believe in people changing into wolves at a full moon, but aesthetically, this thing lined up with what many consider to be a werewolf, except it looked much more fierce and hulking than I could have ever imagined. This is why I now permanently stay out of the swamps. I know those tales are real, I don't know if they're demons or if they're living animals or whatever they are. I prefer to consider them guardians of the swamp. And I guess that day, however you want to look at it, this thing was looking out for me. Or so I'd like to think. I rented a cabin in the hills of Tennessee for my wife and I's 45th anniversary my wife and I both challenged ourselves to a level of roughing it than either of us were ever used to. We used to tease each other that if we could survive this marriage, we could survive anything. You would have thought that things were going off without a hitch. The weather was gorgeous, and we settled into the isolation of the cabin just fine. The nights were cool, and I regretted not getting a place with glass in the windows. But I wasn't going to admit that to my wife, and I was sure she wasn't going to admit that to me either. Both of us snored, and it was a guess who would be woken up by the other, whoever was the first to complain. Well, I woke up first, but there was more to be heard in the darkness than my wife sawing logs. There, seemed to be a sound coming from just outside the window, right above our bed. It was a bestial grunting that I couldn't place. It was too soft to be outdone by the sound of my wife's snoring. I curled up against the cold fresh air that drifted in, but there was a smell of wet dog that would drift in on the edge of my senses at very odd intervals. And just as soon as I was sure that's what I was smelling. It was then gone. Bobbing in and out of sleep, it occurred to me that there could somehow be a lunatic skulking around the property outside. If that were the case, we were in a fix, being so far away from the police. I was no dummy. I packed a 10 millimeter and kept it nearby at all times. The smell and the sounds remained very close to our window. 
when I felt that I was awake enough, I slipped out of bed as quietly as possible and took the gun from the dresser. I quietly slid a magazine into it and readied myself for a confrontation outside. Though the window was without glass, it had narrow wooden bars, so I was sure that I could safely leave my wife's side. When I came around to the side of the cabin, where I was sure I would find a madman crouched beneath the window, I found instead a great large mass of shadow that was just no making sense of. It was furry, and my brain tried to tell me it was a bear, but it just wasn't the right shape. It then turned its head toward me, which gave me a start. I thought I had come to its side of the cabin in perfect stealth. I don't remember ever hearing bears with glowing eyes. This wasn't that reflective light like you see in cats. This was almost like the light of a candle, except it was coming inside the beast's eyes. It went from crouching to standing, and it was absolutely massive. What I thought were demonic horns turned out to be long ears that were no less hellish. I felt my gun was shrinking in my hand, and it made it all the more urgent that I shoot the monster stalking me and my wife. I almost didn't take the shot as it neared me. It seemed to grow in size exponentially. I finally couldn't take it anymore, and I raised my colt and fired into the threatening shadow. I surprised it. I'll never know if I heard it. It had charged me, but changed its trajectory a bit when the bullets found their marks. Claws grazed my ribs. My wife woke me up in the daylight, spilling across the grass. My wounds weren't as bad as they could have been. I made it through our anniversary somewhat tender. We made it a point to never go back to that very remote location. We didn't need the addition of monstrous wolf demon things to negotiate with. And my wounds were only superficial at best. I don't think this thing's intentions were at trying to hurt me or kill me. I think, honestly, it was bluff charging me and just gave me a clean swipe. With as big as this thing was, it could have honestly ripped me in two, so I don't know why it basically tickled me with its claws. Again, my wounds weren't terribly deep. They have left scars, but nothing I couldn't deal with. Nothing that I needed to go to the hospital with. As far as what I encountered... It's the only thing I can think of is a wolf man or some sort of giant upright walking wolf that now stalks the woods of Tennessee. My wife, however, doesn't know about this because I told her it was a bear. When I was a kid, Halloween and especially trick-or-treating was by far my most favorite time of the year even more so that Christmas or birthdays just couldn't match up to. It wasn't just because of the candy, although obviously that was great too. But what I really enjoyed was dressing up and then walking around the neighborhood with my buddies. I love seeing everybody else, and oftentimes even adults in costumes, visiting houses where people had spent hours decorating it was fun and safe, and everybody knew everyone. We always had a blast every year. This particular event happened right around 1996 or 1997. I was 10 or 11 years old. Since we were beginning to get a little older, our costumes were beginning to get a little more elaborate and more scary. There were some real spooky and realistic looking ghosts and vampires and even creatures from the Black Lagoon. There were even a couple of werewolves, which I was both fascinated by and also terrified of. Of all the nightmare creatures, it was actually werewolves that scared me the most. I had seen American Werewolf in London, the Howling series, and that one by Stephen King. I think it's called Silver Bullet, but I can't be too sure. Those movies, werewolves in general, just scared me. 
but I had this weird, morbid love for them. Anyway, we never saw it as a contest. If you were a witch and you saw another witch, you gave that kid a high five. This was a fun night. Not the time to sulk that somebody had a nicer, pointier hat or a bigger fake wart on their nose. So when the kid, wearing an unbelievably cool dog costume, I didn't care that it was way more realistic than it was weird, because he kept disappearing and then reappearing at the house we were calling at. Like he was there one minute, staring at us with his dog face, and then gone, back again. It was strange. One of the girls I was with, Sadie, was a bit more nosy, and this kid doing weird magic tricks was really getting to her. She wanted to know who it was, how he had gotten such a realistic looking costume, and how he had kept ducking out without seeing us. So, once we got a hit up with candy bars, she turned to me and told me that I'm gonna have to go talk to that kid. Now, another thing about nosy Sadie, you did as she said, she began to walk down to where we had saw this kid reappearing behind the brush. Only that's when this story went from a cute Halloween story to absolutely real and terrifying. Not long before there, maybe, I don't know, 60 feet, if I had a guess from memory, was thick wilderness that branched the entire end of that entire neighborhood. I'm not really sure what lied beyond there. It was kind of just the ending point of that whole neighborhood. Well, as we approached the brush that we were seeing this, what we thought was a kid, we saw that same kid stand up, even taller than before. And since we were closer, we realized that this possibly wasn't somebody or something in a costume because it stood up very tall, not too much taller than us but a little bit taller, and it even had glowing yellow eyes, and took off running into the woods, where we turned and saw another one, much, much larger, probably about double the size of the one that stood up in front of us behind the brush that ran into the woods. That one seemed to be utterly massive, with glowing red eyes, staring at us. We were terrified. That's when it began letting out a low growl, holding onto the trees, slowly making its way out in the open. Of course it was nighttime, and it was dark over there, but we could still see the general silhouette and shapes of it, even through the dim lighting. We took off running, wondering if this thing had decided to make itself known on Halloween night. Looking back as an adult, I know now more about creatures and cryptids that aren't supposed to exist. My adult perspective is this, that somehow, and keep in mind that it just so happened to be Halloween, which has nothing to do with this thing appearing, I just think it was a coincidence. I believe we saw an adolescent dogman that was curious and was watching us trick-or-treating. When we approached it, it ran off and the much, much bigger one was probably the alpha male or the female, the parent of the adolescent. Why it never attacked us? Well, maybe it was just giving off a very threatening growl to warn us. I don't know, but I know these things exist. I know they're out there, as terrifying as it was. I understand it might sound cheesy and hokey that we happen to see it on Halloween, but I'll just reiterate that I don't think us seeing this thing on Halloween night had any coincidence whatsoever. It was just by chance. I was camping by myself in a few of the pines that surrounded the Rockies. What can I say? I used to be a loner. You can't really experience the wilderness unless you experience it completely alone and in isolation. Anyway, night was falling rapidly, and I did the responsible thing. I extinguished the fire, but I also did the smart thing, and I buried some of the embers. 
The insulation in the ground would keep them hot, and I'll be able to start my fire afresh the next day. I got in my tent. I lay down facing the tent opening, and I left it open slightly. And I don't feel this so much as a safety issue as it is a matter of survival. Like the dog that walks around and circles several times before it finally lays down. I like to make sure that I'm going to be safe. I'm a very light sleeper, and the slightest disturbance will wake me up, and I'll be ready to defend myself in full. Well, there was a disturbance. I opened my eyes and I looked out into the crack of the tent into the darkness, where I thought I saw some of the embers of the fire. This confused me, and I even questioned if I was still dreaming, because I know for a fact that I had extinguished the fire. It was when the embers weren't doing anything except hovering in the air that my senses started to tell me something wasn't right. Other details started slipping my fog of sleep, such as the fact that the two embers weren't red, nor orange. They were yellow, almost amber. For a split second, they blinked as if they were eyes. With my heart pounding in my head, I reached beside me for my pistol and my flashlight. What happened next? A very quick succession but the intensity of it all made it seem to last for hours. I lit this thing up with my flashlight. I came face to face with the most grotesque wolf-like gargoyle creature I had ever laid my eyes on. Its back was hunched, claws like scythes, and the hatred and malice that poured and emanated out of this being was more starkly displayed in its features than its facial expression. I know, I landed one or two good shots on it, but that somehow didn't stop it. Maybe it's a come to its wounds later on, assuming it was a mortal creature. I know that might sound hokey, but I've never heard of a creature like this. I'll know, for sure, that if I see it next time, I'm putting it down for good. Hopefully, this is the last time I'll have ever seen it.